Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study where we believe that the word of God will be made manifest, will be simplified, will be revealed to you. But before we begin, let's take this moment and dedicate this session before God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We're excited for what you're doing in the lives of people today. We glorify your name. We receive your word today, King of Glory. Have your way in us. Let your name be glorified above every other name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last week where we broke off, <laughs> the Second war had been had passed. And the Bible told us, behold, the third war is coming quickly. And today, we come to the last trumpet. The seventh trumpet, which ushers God's kingdom and his judgment on the sinful. In this part, we see the church getting ready to witness the next phase of its redemptive story, which is Jesus Christ's return. As we open our Bibles, we'll be taking our text from the book of Revelation chapter 11, from verse 15 to verse 19. Let's read. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell down on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake and a great hail. Here, the Bible is revealing to us the coming in place of the third war, which we see in verse 14, that the Bible tells us is coming quickly. Now when we say that word quickly, the implication is not that it is nearing the end of the age, but that this is coming 
coming in rapid succession. There is no more waiting. The seventh war, uh, the seventh trumpet, coincides with the seventh seal which also coincides with what we will see later as the seventh ball. Now, what you need to understand that I told you the last time around, that these events are not happening in a chronological way, but rather there is an overlap of times and events in a certain way forming like a crescendo that will climax with the great return of our Lord. Now when the seventh trumpet is sounded, John reveals to us that there were voices in heaven and there was a declaration and the declaration was that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Now there has been a lot of back and forth on whether it was kingdom or kingdoms. Now, some versions point to kingdom. Other versions say kingdoms. Now, you may ask which is which. I will take us back to our description of the microscopic versus the telescopic approach. Where somebody, where the version talks about kingdom, they are zeroing in on the principality or the certain portion that did not believe in Christ before that had not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You see in John chapter 12 verse 31 in John chapter 14 verse 30 and John chapter 16 16 verse 11. Jesus refers to the devil as the prince of this world or the ruler of this world. So him and the people that sub subject to him form a certain form of kingdom that had not surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. But now, with this declaration, this kingdom is aligned to all the other kingdoms under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. To put it in perspective, Jesus reigns over all the earth, over all the kingdoms of the earth. So whoever said kingdom and the one who said the kingdoms of this world are both saying the same thing. In other words, all the kingdoms of the world now become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. That is the most important thing that we need to understand. But I want you to I want to point you out to something very important here. There is something that is happening which we should draw our attention to. I want us to remember another place in scripture where the kingdoms of this world have been offered to Jesus Christ. And you got it. It is in Luke chapter 4. 
and Matthew chapter 4. When you read in Luke chapter 4 from verses 5 to 8, the same account that we see in Matthew chapter 4 from verse 8 to 10. When, when Jesus was in the wilderness, the devil takes him up to the mountain. And in an instant, shows him all the kingdoms of this world. And he tells him, if you bow down and worship me, I am going to give you all these kingdoms. Because they have been given to me. Now, some people take that scripture to imply that the kingdoms of this world belong to the devil. That is not truthful. That is a lie from the devil. The Bible tells us in Psalm 24 verse 1 that the earth and the fullness thereof belong to God. In Psalm 2 verse 8 he comes back to us and says ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So the only one who has the authority to give is God and not the devil. So in this instant in scripture, the devil was trying to give what did not belong to him. And so many of us think that the earth belongs to the devil. It does not. The earth is the Lord. He is the one that created it. He's the one that owns it. The kingdoms thereof belong to our God. That is why he promotes leaders. He raises one, puts down another. And the Bible tells us that the hearts of kings are in his hands and he turns them whichever way he will. The, the Bible further tells us that all authority comes from God. So I want you to change your perspective. Get to understand that though right now it may not look like all the kingdoms are surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. It is only a matter of time. All the kingdoms will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign, the Bible says, forever and ever from everlasting to everlasting of his kingdom there shall not be end hallelujah Amen. that should excite you and I because once we understand that then those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ have a reason to celebrate because he has made us kings and priests to our God. And the Bible tells us we shall reign with him on the earth. No wonder when he comes, he shall not be referred to as a king. He shall be referred to as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So we will be the kings making him the king of kings. We will give us the lordship that he becomes the lord of lords. And that is such an exciting message. 
That is the perspective we need to understand of what God has done, of the mystery of the heavens that the Bible unveils to us in the book of Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. Look at what it says. This is what the Bible tells us. It says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. There is nothing that God has not made plain. Therefore, don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't even listen to your own reasoning because it could be corrupted. We need to see the things the way God sees them. And for you, child of God, this has grave implications for you today. Because we need to do the things the way God prescribes them. Just imagine if Jesus in the wilderness had decided to take a shortcut, he would have failed the way the first Adam failed. In the same way with us, right now, we should not be ignorant of the wives of the devil. We should be conversant with his shortcuts. With the way he tries to make us to be pragmatic. In order to do things that are in disobedience to God's will. We need to be able to wait upon God. To wait for his choice. To wait for his direction. To wait for his timing. That is the difference between being obedient and being disobedient. May I point you out also? That half obedience is disobedience. Actually, the Lord says, for him, disobedience is equivalent to witchcraft. Now, let's see the response of heaven. In verse 15, <laughs> the Bible says when this was declared, there was celebration in heaven. We see all the elders, the 24 elders that we saw before casting down their crowns. Now they are not casting down crowns. Now they fall to the ground face down before the throne of God. And they break out in song. And they begin to celebrate. Celebrating God on two accounts. They are celebrating God for who he is. The Bible tells us in that portion of scripture that they break down in song and say we give you thanks O Lord God Almighty. They are giving thanks to God for who he is. He is God Almighty. The omnipotent one. The one whose plans cannot be thwarted. The one whose intentions cannot be diverted. The one whose purposes must be fulfilled. It is not a matter of if they will be fulfilled. It is only a matter of when they will be fulfilled. Therefore, take heart where you are in the circumstances 
circumstances of your life. Whatever God promised, He will bring to pass in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. What are they celebrating? They are saying the one who is, who was, and who is to come. I understand some versions say who is and who was. Now, saying who is, who was, is looking at it from the point of eternity. In other words, they're saying we are now in the present, which is eternity. Who is, who was. Now, when the versions that say who is, who was, and who is to come are looking at it from the present, again, there is no point of contention here. It is just a perspective. One is looking at it from the point of eternity. And another is looking at it from the present. Back to what I said. We don't need to be microscopic about this. We, we don't need to see something small and then try to magnify it. We need to be telescopic. See the big, big picture and bring it in reality for what it is. That should be our understanding. Back to what the elders are doing. They are giving God thanks on account of five things. They are ascribing glory and honor to God for his sovereignty and for the exercising of his power through all eternity. In essence, they are praising God and thanking him for his sovereignty. Now, let me ask you, how many times do you give thanks to God because he's sovereign? You see, the sovereignty of God is something that should amaze anyone. When we say God is sovereign, we are saying, that there is absolutely nothing that happens in the universe that is outside of God's influence and authority. In other words, he has no limitations. He knows all things, past, present, and future. And he controls all things. So there is nothing that happens to you that takes him by accident or catches him off guard or takes him by surprise. There is absolutely nothing that happens in your life that is unaware of. Those are the two things they, first of all, thank God for. Now, the third are three things they do praise him for. I told you there were five. Number three is the change of his reign. There has been a change of reign. There has been a change of power. The kingdoms that were previously not under his rulership have now gone under his rulership. So now he oversees everything end to end. All principalities, all powers, all dominion, all authority is subject to him. Now, the fourth thing they thank and praise God for is the display of his wrath towards evil. And the fifth thing they thank God for is his judgment and the reward 
that he gives to the prophets, the Old Testament and the New Testament saints. This is also very exciting because the Bible says this reward shall be given to both the great and the small. There is a reward and that is something to look expectantly and excited about. That as we go about life, there is that day of reckoning when your labor shall be rewarded. I have met so many people who say, I did this, but nobody thanked me. I, 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 I have done this, I have done this, but nobody thanked me. The Bible tells us that God is a data to no man. In the end, he will pay. He will reward you. He tells us in Matthew 25, when he talked about the parable of the talents, there is that voice we all yearn to hear. Those of us that are faithfully serving God to hear the echo of his voice saying, well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the little. I'm now entrusting you with much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Listen to those words of encouragement. Therefore, don't give up. Don't, don't give up when they don't appreciate it's okay. God sees. And the Bible tells us that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So never give up concerning what you do for the kingdom. Don't be tempted even when you don't see the result. Whatever he has promised, he is able to accomplish. I want you to see something else happening here. In verse 19, the Bible says, Then the temple was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now look at that. We then see the Ark of the Covenant seen in the temple. I mentioned in the previous chapters that the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And that is a fact. But in spite of they having everything put in place. There is something missing. There is no ark. <laughs> Nobody knows where it is. Now here in verse 19, <laughs> the Bible tells us that the temple of God in heaven was open. And what do we see? The ark inside the temple. <laughs> Here is something that speaks volume. Why the ark? Because the ark speaks of God's faithfulness, covenant blessings to his people. Whenever we see the ark, we understand that whatever God has promised, he will fulfill. It amazes us also to see that this chapter 11, begins with the desecration of the earthly temple and ends with the unveiling of the glorious temple. The point is we are not in going into decline 
We are moving from glory to glory. We are moving from majesty into majesty. It may not be apparent to you. But you need to go back to God's word. To understand how everything will end. Look at this. Consider a sports event. We just concluded the 10,000 meters of the Olympics. Olympics. Now, for those who watched the games live, you had two Ugandans that went neck to neck until the very end. Cheptegei and Kilimo. And one of them ended up being number two and the other taking the bronze. Now, for someone who was watching the event live, there was a lot of tension as the athletes were making the last run on the way to get to the finish line. Now, for somebody who has told, and you are watching this after, you already know the results. So your adrenaline will not go up or down. You already know who will be number one, who will be number two, and who will be number three. In the same way, why do we have the book of Revelation? So that we get the picture of how everything will end. In the end, Jesus reigns. In the end, Jesus wins. So it doesn't matter how it bad it looks right now. It, it doesn't matter how terrible it looks like now. In the end, Jesus reigns. So what does that mean to you and I? You see, many people today are living in circumstances that they consider lack or accident. But you are not an accident about to happen. You are not a product of lack. You see, from a human perspective, it may appear that you are where you are by accident. But from God's perspective, it is not. Your circumstances may be the work of evil. And that evil has held your family in its grasp. But you need, you need to understand that grasp can be broken. Because God knows no limits. In the end, Jesus reigns. Nothing is a surprise to God. Nothing is a setback to his plan. Nothing can thwart his purposes. Nothing is beyond his control. So instead of running away from God, let the circumstances of your life draw you towards God. So what does that say to us today? It is a very clear statement for us that though what happened to us yesterday is beyond our control. Yes, there might be certain irreparable things in your life. There may be things in your life that are beyond repair. There may be lost opportunities in your life that will never return. God can still turn around the destructive state that you are in right now and provide you with a future that is beyond your imagination. What is expected of you? 
That is the question you must be asking. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 28, the Jews approached Jesus and asked almost a similar question. They said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? In other words, what is it that we must do? To somebody just not giving thought to this question, you will come up with two answers. One, everything. Another, nothing. And both are wrong. Jesus, in response, tells them that you need to believe in whom God sent. He's saying, believe in me. The message is believing in the Lord Jesus. Because in the end, he wins. In the end, he reigns. In the end, everything comes under his subjection. In the end, everything comes under his authority. But wait a minute. What does it mean to believe the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, this is a question that we need to look at very clearly. Number one, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is to recognize that he is present. Present now. He is the I am. He is the light of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the good shepherd. He is your strength. He is your life. He is the resurrection. He is the power. Not in the future, but right now where you are. Seven times we have it in the gospel. Jesus declares the term I am. He does not say I will be. He doesn't say I was. He says I am. Right now. Where you are. Why does he say I am? He's pointing to you that he is alive. He's not dead. He died and rose. His resurrection is evidence that he will die no more. His resurrection suggests to you and me that no matter what is around you, it can be overcome. So you need to come to that point of understanding that he is. Now, number two, to believe in Jesus Christ is to learn to look at your situation through his eyes. Not through your eyes. I'll give you an example. You can look at your situation and you say, I am cast. In his eyes, you are blessed. Now, when you look at your situation through your eyes, you are going to see a curse. That is not believing in him. To believe in him, you have to look at the same situation. The same way he's looking at the situation. When he looks at you, he says, you are blessed. Why? Because I became a curse for you. That you become, you inherit the blessing. He says when he looks at you, he says, you are healed. Why? Why? Because 
of his stripes. So from his perspective, he sees you healed. Yet when you look at yourself, you say, I still feel the headache. I, I, I still feel the tumor inside. You are looking at it from your perspective. You are looking at it through your through the faith of the flesh. If I may put it that way. You are not believing in Jesus. To believe in Jesus, you have Christ. to view the situation. You have to see life as he sees it. Look at the circumstances of your life. Are you seeing your life as Jesus sees it? Or you're seeing it as you see it? You're seeing it as a Ugandan or an African or are you using the Jesus approach and seeing it as a son and a daughter of the kingdom of God number three what does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus to believe in the Lord Jesus is to listen to what he has to say now, you, you cannot have that perspective unless you are attentive to what he's saying. Unless his word becomes of prime importance in your life. You see, that calls you to draw closer to him in a relationship. You see, the people you are closer to, you often take their words to heart. Let me give you a perspective. If somebody you did not know, and somebody you know, says something about you, that, that is not of good taste to you, what hurts more? Very well. It is the words of the person you know. The words of the person you are in relationship with. You, you, you even when I say, how can so and so say this? Why? Because you are in a relationship with them. But if somebody you don't know say the same thing, Say, that one doesn't know me. Now, let, let's bring the message home. The reason why many of us are not taking the word of God to heart, it comes down to the relationship. You know more about what your auntie said Uncle said, teacher said, brother said, but what is God saying? What is he saying to you right now? One of the things I've discovered about life, that often in life it is not what people say that brings us down but it is what we are saying to ourselves. So in order for us to believe in Jesus Christ, we must listen to what he says. We must take to heart his word. We must believe his word. You cannot believe in Jesus without believing his word. Next point. It is to understand his point of view. For you to believe in Jesus, you need to understand his point of view. When he says this is sin, that is his point of view. 
understand it and adopt it as sin. Don't explain it. Don't try to uh, bring a philosophy around it. Don't try to put anything around it. Don't try to remove anything from it. It is exactly what he says it is. That is what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to get to that point where you believe and are assured that he knows what he is talking about. You must come to that point where you believe without any shadow of doubt that he can do whatever he says he can do. That is very important for us. Number five, to believe in the Lord Jesus involves us learning to use the resources he has made available to us. It is amazing that when we become believers in Jesus Christ, our level of potency goes to the nth degree. Our ability to do things goes to Levels that are unimaginable. Look at what happens in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. When Jesus has risen from the dead, the disciples come to him and they ask him, There is something that is weighing hard on their hearts. They say, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They are interested in getting rid of the Roman Empire. They want to get rid of these chains of slavery. And they're looking to this Messiah. Now that he is risen, he cannot die again. They're asking, is this the time? And he turns to them. And he says, it is not for you to know the time. In other words, don't concern yourself with this. This is with the Father. You have some business to take care of. You shall receive power. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you. In other words, you are not going out there powerless. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And as a result of that event, you are going to receive power. Power from on high. Power from God. And that power is not for you to sit comfortably slain in the Holy Ghost. No, 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 no. That's just an experience. <laughs> he said, the power that you shall receive is power with purpose. It is power to witness of me. So the power that we receive is the power to reveal Christ. Is the power to demonstrate Christ. Is the power to reveal to the world who Jesus Christ is. Is the empowerment in our lives to testify of the grace of Christ, of the love of Christ, of the mercy of Christ, of the forgiveness of Christ. We have a message to proclaim. That message is Jesus 
Christ. It cannot be a message of a particular church. <laughs> it is not a political message. <laughs> it is a message of a person. It is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you believer of Jesus Christ, what is your message? What is your message? Is it Jesus Christ? Or is it somebody else? Is it something else? We need to get back to the basic. If we confess to be believing in Jesus Christ, then we need to learn to use the resources he has provided. That he has made available for us to testify of him. So our lives should be pointing people to Jesus Christ. Our words should be bringing people to Jesus Christ. Our actions should be drawing people to Jesus Christ. Does that define you? When we say we need to use the tools available to us. This is what it means. Even when it comes to overcoming evil. He says, In my name, you shall cast out demons. And they shall flee. In my name. It is amazing. Three things Jesus left us with. They are the things we completely overlook. His name. His word and the Holy Spirit. Three powerful things that he left the church with. And they are the things that we overlook. And we focus on things that he did not. Sprinkling of water. That, that's not what he gave us. We become microscopic and we forget what he has given us. It is like somebody coming to tell you, this is a hole, use it to dig. And then you get a panga and use it to dig. It is like you are not understanding. He has given you this as the effective tool to use. Yet when the moment comes, you choose the tool that he did not give you to use. The question I need to ask, are you believing in him? To believe him, you use and apply what he has given you for the situation he has given you. Praise be to God. That's very important for us. Today we see a lot of things happening inside and outside the church. And the situation is despicable. Why? Because we come to a point where it looks like we don't believe that what he has provided us with is sufficient. Our sufficient is not of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. That's why the Bible tells us that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of power may be of God and not of us. You should stop leaning on the hand of flesh. Child of God, 
begin to lean on the hand of God. Begin to believe that what Jesus has provided for is sufficient. That what he has provided for to overcome evil is sufficient. That what he has provided for to remove obstacles is sufficient. That what he has provided for to pull down strongholds is sufficient. We saw in the text Jesus Christ heaven is declaring that now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Amazing scripture. He did not fight for it. They were handed over to Him. Why? As a result of obedience. He set that example for us. That's why the Bible says us, let this mind be in you that was in Christ also. See, when he humbled himself, God exalted him. Now you're going to tell me, Pastor, but there's that scripture which says from the days of John the Baptist the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force many of us have misquoted this scripture to look at this scripture we need to go to Luke 16 16 John Jesus is talking about the life and the ministry of John the Baptist. He is in prison. He is confused that he is behind bars having introduced Jesus Christ to the world. So he sends people out to say, go ask him, is he the one or we should look for another? Now Jesus begins to explain the circumstances under which John is. And he says from the days of John the Baptist, See now, the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. He's saying the kingdom is still being oppressed by people who are violent. That is why John is in prison. Because the violent are still oppressing the kingdom. But now, he is risen. Remember before he left, he said, in this world, you shall have many troubles, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome. So, finally, to believe in the Lord Jesus is to count on him to be at work in your ordinary life as you respond to the situations that you are faced with. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, Behold, I will be with you until the end of the age. He is here right now. Where you are right now, you need to leave your past at the cross with him. You need to leave that irreparable past in his nail-pierced hands. Hear him say, leave it here. You are not designed to carry it. Let it rest here. And step out into the future that I died to ensure that you lay hold of. If you are in that situation, I am going to believe God with you. We are going to believe that you will lay 
down everything at the feet of Christ and believe him as you step into the future that he died to prepare for you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, today you have revealed to us that the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. There is nothing that is not subject to your authority. I behold, I bring before you that brother, that sister, that woman, that child, that man that is troubled, that one that feels forsaken, that one that feels overcome, that one that feels powerless, that one that is desolate, that one that is helpless. Here we are, Lord. You know our troubles. You know our challenges. You know the depth, the breadth, the width, and the height of our problems. Yet you declare, Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Even now, Lord, you the God who declares that you are the resurrection and the life. In the authority of your word, the authority of your name, and in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we speak to every sickness, we speak to every condition, we speak to every situation of paralysis, we speak to every sickness, we command it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. To lose its hold over the people of God in the name of Jesus Christ. We speak healing right now in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Be set free now in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. May every chain be broken in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Be set free from your head to the soles of your feet. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, we declare your freedom, Lord, in the lives of your people. We declare your freedom, Lord, in their health, Lord. We declare your freedom, Lord, in their financial aspects, Lord. We break that date of that sin of date in their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, King of glory, and Lord of honor by your power Lord by your majesty intervene king of glory manifest your greatness manifest your glory that your name be praised in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God and God's people say it, amen now let's go to somebody you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. He's not Lord of your life. He's not Savior of your life. This is your moment. Come to him. He says, come unto me. The invitation is to come. His arms are open to receive you. There is no sin he cannot wash away. There is nothing he cannot overcome. Come to him by faith. He will heal you. He will save you. So if you have never received Jesus in your life, if you are backslidden, filled with guilt, Filled with shame. This is your moment. Why don't you repeat this prayer? And the Holy Spirit shall come. And times of refreshing will come from the presence of God and overshadow your heart. 
heart. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your mind and heart in Christ. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Say this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. Whatever I have tried has not worked. Filled with shame. Filled with guilt. Filled with fear, I come to you. Save me, Lord Jesus. Wash away my sin. I believe you are the Savior of the world. Write my name in that book of life. That from this day forward, I will live my life for you. My life will be an imprint of your power, majesty, and glory. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving me, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you say that prayer, Jesus has come in your life. Yes, I'm a zoku zjabulani. Accept you. I'm a zoku lokole. There is a number on the screen. What we now may now put it. Pick up that phone. Kube simu. Make that call. Kuku bili. Somebody will be able to pick it up. What you again do? Kwa lokola. And give you the first steps. Akuwe ebitani kiduwa into this new life that you have just made. You have a testimony. We know who Julius is called. Let us know what God is doing. We take a second and from Dominion Church International. We know who is called Dominion Church. So we meet again next week. God bless you. Shalom. Amen.